Welcome everyone to the October edition of Talk Polymath. I'm Terry Schindler from Polyplexus. For those of you joining us who don't know about Polyplexus, we are the host of this podcast and we're a platform for scientific and technical creators focused on accelerating cross-disciplinary innovation through evidence-based conversation. You can join us at polyplexus.com. So now let me introduce our Talk Polymath guest. We're so pleased to have Jamie Arbib, co-founder of Rethink X, joining us from London. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you, Terry. It's great to be with you. Jamie and his co-founder, Stanford MBA and MIT graduate Tony Siba, analyzed the speed and scale of technology-driven disruption and its implications. A graduate in history from Trinity College, Cambridge, with a master's in sustainability leadership, also from Cambridge. So, Jimmy, I thought maybe we could start by tell us about Rethink X, how you guys see the world and what you're trying to do. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, so Rethink X is a, is a not for profit research group that I co founded, as you said, with Tony Sieber. And um, really, our aim is to um, bring a complex systems based framework we've developed to um, understand technology disruptions. So, we look at uh, different sectors of the economy. Um, food and agriculture, energy, transportation, and so on, um, and try and understand um, how technology can potentially disrupt them, um, the kind of non-linear processes of, 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 of disruption, but also how the impacts of disruption can kind of cascade out from the individual sector being disrupted across society, affecting everything from kind of geopolitics through to um, uh, you know, through to climate change outcomes and so on. Because you know, in our in our in our in in our view, the, the most of the analysis that's done either by Wall Street or um, governments or big NGOs tends to be essentially simple systems analysis. We 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 tend to you know look at look, look at the world in silos. We break up the complexity into individual parts, and we um and, and and we analyze kind of direct cause and effect, but we don't look at the kind of cascading effects of change. And and you know, in, in Tony and my's um, analysis. You know, we, are, we see ourselves and the economy on the cusp of the most profound transformation, really in human history, that every sector of the economy looks likely to be disrupted over the next decade or two, uh, which will have transformational impacts on, on, on pretty much every domain of human activity. Uh, and, and, and we don't think that people are fully prepared for this, understand either the speed or the scale or the impact of disruption. So, um, yeah, we, we founded Rethink X as a not-for-profit, and, and our mission is to um, reach decision makers with alternative analysis on which we hope they can take better decisions. And how did you meet Tony? Well, so, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a story that goes back maybe six years now. I, I was invited along by a US military think tank uh, in Washington to a scenario planning day. So they were, they were asking the question, you know, what will, what will it mean for geopolitics if we have a rapid energy transition, you know, quicker than we're, we're already forecasting? And they invited a group of experts. I think there were 10 of us invited to the day. Um, eight of those experts were from kind of big institutions, you know, departments of state, uh, big oil company scenario teams, um, you know, consultants, big NGOs, and, 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 and the like. And then, and then a couple of outsiders, really, you know, Tony and I, kind of independent analysts. And, and, um, and I remember sitting through this day, and, and, and there were, you know, eight of, these, these, um, eight, eight of these presentations were pretty much identical, you know, forecasting the adoption of, of electric vehicles and solar PV and, 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 and so on. And there were these kind of low linear forecasts you know, out to 2050 and even beyond in certain instances. And they saw maybe 10, 20% disruption all within a pretty tight band. Um, sorry, 20% adoption of, of, of solar or electric vehicles. Even by that. Now, I'll never forget Tony getting up halfway through the day when it was his turn to talk and saying, look, you know, that's not how disruption works. You know, it's not a slow incremental progression. It's rapid, it's non-linear. You know, it's an S-curve of technology adoption. And if you're going to make your plans and 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 um, and strategies on the back of these, you know, faulty forecasts, uh, you're going to make some serious mistakes. And and I basically got up and said, well, you know, I agree with Tony. And uh, <laughs> and so, you know, the two of us went for coffee afterwards, and we spoke for months and months about everything from food and agriculture through to education, through to climate change, and 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 really, you know, 
we both we, we both agreed that that you know things were going to happen much faster than, than than people expected over the, the coming decade or two and we were totally unprepared because we use these faulty forecasting tools and 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 we felt ultimately that we had no choice but to set up uh, a research group that could that could you know produce what we think is is better research and i think it's so interesting that you're his, you're a history major because do we have any lessons in history that 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 even come close to sort of helping us understand what's happening now yeah i mean there are plenty of lessons in history so so i mean i'm desperate to write a book about this i mean in some ways we did we wrote a book called rethinking humanity that we published we published last year which which looks really at the history of civilization you know back 10,000 years to today and then forward but a couple of decades really, you know, really making the argument that, look, under the surface, you know, in any complex system, including human society, but, you know, we see the same processes in, in, in ecosystems and in evolution and in, you know, the human body and, and, and the climate system and so on, that the pattern of change is the same. You get these long periods of incremental progress when the system's held in equilibrium by these kind of negative or negative feedback loops that we call breaks. Um, and then at, at a certain point in time, you know, we can pass a, you know, a threshold, a tipping point, essentially, where the accelerating feedback loops take over and we flip very quickly into a different, in, into a different state. And that's what we've seen in, 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 in human history, the same kind of pattern. If you, if you look at a graph, say, of, of the largest city in human history, you know, what we see there, you know, after the Neolithic Revolution, when we settle down as, as farmers in cities, you see, you know, you know, the size of, of, of a community that can be supported grow from, you know, a few hundreds as, as foragers, you know, up into the thousands. And then, you know, that's a maximum for millennia. And then in, in, in Suma, you know, Uruk particularly, uh, we see a breakthrough and, and it's, a, you know, a convergence of, of, of technological breakthroughs, you know, irrigation and bronze and writing and and um and and the plow and and and, and so on and so forth that allow them to, to operate at a higher you know a higher level and 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 the, the maximum size of city goes from a few thousand up towards a hundred thousand in just a few centuries uh and 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 for millennia that's kind of the maximum and then the Romans make another breakthrough, and then, um, and then of course the industrial age, we, we we take it up into the tens of millions, and and you know that's a cycle of, of of kind of breakthrough and then collapse that we see through history. But it's driven by the same forces, by these same kind of systems dynamics, the feedback loops that 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 that, that drive that nonlinear pattern of change, and 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 so in many ways the sort of the events in 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 history are really an outcome. They're kind of the noise on the surface. Of these underlying forces and processes and most of the time we don't you know we don't engage with them we, we, we ignore them and, and and that's fine in, in a kind of equilibrium period you know as we have been for maybe 200 years as a, as a as a civilization but when we come up to these periods of transformation it's incredibly important to understand what's going on and you can you can see the possibilities that are emerging as these forces begin to gather pace so to that end you recently released a report on climate change in which you maintain, and I think you're one of the authors on that report, um, technology disruptions already underway across the energy, transportation, and food sectors have enormous implications for getting close to net zero emissions. Can you, what do you mean by that? Can you explain that? Yeah, so maybe let's start at a high level. Well, and then perhaps we can kind of dive in into some of the details. So, so you know, 90% of, of, of global greenhouse gas emissions come from energy, transportation and food, those three systems. And, um, and, and, and what we see in our analysis, and we've done you know, this report in some ways is a kind of synthesis, synthesis of the, the three individual sector reports that we've published on those sectors. But we see rapid transformations. Uh, within each of those sectors, rapid disruptions where the old kind of industrial era technologies are replaced by by um, by new cleaner technologies. So solar, wind, and batteries, and in 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 electric power, you know, autonomous and electric vehicles in transportation, and precision fermentation, and possibly cellular agriculture in 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 the in the food space. Each of which is 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 um, you know vastly uh, more efficient. But, but but also you know will will be as the 2020s progress far lower cost and 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 uh, and, and with better capabilities than the, than the alternatives and so you know that's what's going to drive these disruptions rapidly and and those three sectors 
will be rapidly decarbonized so that, so that by you know the mid 2030s or, or, or 2040 we'll see a you know a rapid decarbonization of, of of those three sectors of the economy but more than that it's the interaction between the sectors that that, that that that's important to understand we can go into that in more detail later on but you know just very briefly you know a disruption um to, to the energy sector for instance affects the need for transport right the need to transport huge quantities of oil and coal and so on around the world so so you know, we see both a, a, a disruption, a first order disruption within the sector, a kind of technology driven, driven disruption, and then sort of second and third order disruptions to the need for each of those, um, the, the, those activities or products. Uh, and then finally, the, 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 the kind of the other kind of second order effect that we look at is really what happens when we when we disrupt livestock farming and the land that's freed up, which you know, has the potential to become an enormous carbon sink. And so, you know, we, we will have the tools by the mid 2030s, not just to decarbonize the flow, you know, the carbon emissions from our activities, but also to help, we will have the tools to cost effectively remove carbon from the atmosphere, to, to deal with the problem of the stock of, 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 of greenhouse gas emissions that we've emitted over the course of, of the industrial era. Um, so it's a very different analysis to, to most of the main mainstream analysis which, which which doesn't see such rapid and profound transformations and 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 and, and the focus is on a very different solution set to, to us no it definitely definitely is a different an analysis how do you conduct your analysis and then i'd like to go through it a little bit um and who are you who does this is this report aimed at is it aimed at policymakers government uh, who is the the your ideal audience yeah, so, so I mean, these reports, um, particularly, we write really for what we term decision makers. So, so um, policymakers, um, you know, business leaders, um, you know, in, in, in investors, and civic leaders, um, and and um, you know, that's really the audience we're writing for. I, th I think we'll you know we'll shortly be turning our attention to a much broader um, narrative that can reach a much wider audience. But for the moment, that's uh, for, certainly for these reports, that's our core audience. And, and the analysis itself, it's mostly based on, how, you know, how, how do you look at the markets? Yeah, so we've, you know, we've, we've, we've built a, a complex systems based framework that we apply. So, so we always start with the technology. We start particularly, I mean, you know, what we're essentially doing is unraveling a complex system. It's all interconnected and interrelated, and, um, but you have to start somewhere. So, so we start with technology cost curves and, and, and we seek to understand how rapidly those can improve, can improve. So, you know, we, you know, we're all kind of a, aware of Moore's law and, and, and so on. But we, we see exponential cost curves in, you know, solar, wind and batteries. We see them in precision biology, which is going to affect our ability to produce food and materials. Um, and, 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 and we see them in, 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 in the transportation space. So, you know, what we see happening are the cost of, um, you know, new protein production, uh, you know, renewable energies, uh, energy production and, and, and transportation plummeting, um, you know, over the course of the next 10, 20 years. And, and these are cost curves that have been, you know, been stable for, for you know, for decades now. We, we've got good evidence as to, as to the trajectory of those, of those cost curves. Um, and, then, and then, you know, we seek to understand essentially the feedback loops that drive disruption. So, you know, often what happens is, you know, as, as um, as a technology drops in cost and, and, and improves in capability, it finds a kind of market entry point. You know, it can be a, from above, it can be like a kind of, you know, an electric vehicle type market where it disrupts, first of all, the top of the market. And then as costs mm -hmm. come down, it opens up the market or it can come from below where you start with lower costs, but lower capabilities and the improving capabilities take it up through the market. Um, or it can be what we call a big bang disruption, which is what, you know, autonomous vehicles on demand will be. You know, once they're good enough and allowed, it'll be both cheaper and better than 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 the existing alternative. So, you, 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 know, the, um, you know, new products and services find a market, and and they trigger these feedback loops that that drive you know for the new technologies are a sort of virtuous cycle of decreasing mm -hmm. costs, increasing economies of scale, um, you know, increasing investment. Um, uh, you know, improving consumer opinion, 
um, improving regulatory frameworks and so on. And they can drive a, drive a virtuous cycle that makes the new kind of ever better and ever cheaper. And on the other side, for the old technology, you, you, you get the reverse. You get a kind of death spiral, a vicious cycle mm -hmm. of, of, of you know, reducing economies of scale, increasing costs, you know, lower utilization, you know, consumer opinion turning against them. Um, you know, lack of investment and, 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 and so on that leads to, to potentially cost rising, cost, you know, cost rising. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, that drives that kind of nonlinear S curve we see in technology disruption. So we, we so, um, and then we seek to analyze the kind of the impacts of that. So what are the, what are the impacts of that? Not just on the value chain. Yeah but also across society. But I think it's important to mention that, you know, these technology disruptions, you know, they tend to be what well, we use the term phase change to, 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 to describe, you know, what happens. Like, you know, it's essentially a change in system state. So it's not simply a technology disruption. You know, it's not a, a car replacing a horse. You know, these, these, these disruptions create a host of new possibilities. So, you know, when the car came along and displaced the horse, um, it also, you know, disrupted agriculture and retail and, and changed the way we built our cities and, 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 you know, where we lived and where we worked and, and, and where we built our schools and hospitals and so on. And, 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 and it created a vastly bigger market and, and new use cases that a horse could never have served. And it's the same with these new technologies. They, they represent very different um, systems that come out the other side. So we're not just replacing a, a gas plant um with a with a solar pv farm we're building a totally different system i mean we can go into individual sectors if that's if that's where you'd like to go somewhere well it's so it, so it would probably present a host of new possibilities but there's also the flip side of that that's also possible right which is this is enormously difficult to absorb for a population i would i mean this is complex um, no. And so there's obviously a, a host of um, possibilities that that might be harder to navigate potentially for um, society? Does that also go hand in hand with this, With if you look at it from your perspective? Yeah, for sure. So, so I mean, absolutely. I mean, so, so, you know, technological progress and disruption, you know, tends to increase our capabilities and, 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 and allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. But yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, I mean, this is, this is in some ways why we set up Rethink X, because, you know, historically we've been very bad at foreseeing these disruptions. Um, we've kind of stumbled into them and then cleaned up the mess retrospectively. The <laughs> communities that have been destroyed, the jobs that have been lost, and so on. And we yeah. kind of we don't even really clean it up half the time. But we, you know, we 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 kind of um, so we're very bad about kind of mitigating those adverse consequences. So so and, you know that's kind of core to our mission is to open people's eyes to what's coming, to allow us to plan and begin to you know protect those communities and people. That, that, that are affected by this. I mean, the answer is never to kind of prop up, you know, uncompetitive and obsolete industries, because over time they get more and more uncompetitive and it gets more and more expensive. Um, and everyone suffers across the economy. The, the, you know, the secret is to, you know, enable those disruptions so we can capture the benefits of them, but for, to protect the people and communities that are affected by it and, 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 to, and to help to, to soften some of those adverse consequences. Right, not to just have, oh, well, here are the winners, here are the losers, good luck, everyone. Right, yeah. um, so I think Rethink X, you, you maintain pretty consistently across your, your publications that people fundamentally misunderstand technological change. You said you heard it at the government um, uh, meeting that you were at. Uh, and I think um, the whole social landscape is certainly proof of this. We don't understand um, sort of some of the, uh, the impact of, of how technology functions. Um, and you've been critical of, of people like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for some of their, uh, some of their um, propositions about, uh, about climate and where we're going. Um, but, so why do you think that we have such a hard time understanding technological change? I mean, it's clearly someone just said on a, I was listening to an interview with the, the guy that uh, directed Social Dilemma, and he called social media the climate change of culture um, because we just we can't deal with it. What what prohibits us from understanding really the nature of technological change? Yeah, I mean, it's a mindset issue, really. I mean, I, I, I think, um, you know, part of the challenge is, is dealing with the complexity in the world. So what we tend to do 
is we break down that complexity. I mean, we have a kind of reductionist mindset that, that breaks down the economy into individual silos. You know, we look at transport or energy or food, at, you know, separate ent in unconnected entities. But also, you know, <clears throat> I mean, that's in, in some ways, the, you know, the nature of science. We, we you know, we, we've broken apart the incredible complexity of the world. We understand, you know, down to the subatomic particle, you know, the functioning of, 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 of the world, but we've kind of lost sight of the kind of the interconnections and the interactions between the pieces. And I think that's the kind of the heart of the problem. We also have this sort of deterministic mindset where, you know, we, we assume that A causes B, but all else remains equal, right? And of course, in a complex system, you know, I mean, outside of the lab, that of course doesn't hold. And, 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 and so, you know, we fail to see the kind of cascading effects of change. We tend to, you know, treat everything other than the variable we're looking at as a constant, essentially. Um, when in fact, pretty much everything is a variable. So, so we can't understand the sheer scale of change. We only look at a very narrow um, change. So we, we kind of extrapolate these, you know, these cost curves and, and, and don't foresee how quickly and how far they... I mean, we, we have these conversations all the time about the cost of technology. I mean, imagine going back to, say, 1970, and having a conversation about how much better computer processing could get, you'd have no idea and, 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 and be unable to comprehend that it could hold the same trajectory, you know, Moore's law, you know, for another few decades. Right? You just can't possibly see it. And, and, you know, people look at a solar panel, you know, today and say, well, how is it going to continue? Now, how are we going to see 80% cost come out over the next decade? That's ludicrous. Um, you know, you, you've got to show me how, how, you know, how that can happen. And I always turn around and say, well, actually, you know, we have a learning curve. We have a cost curve that's been stable now for, for decades. It's up to you to tell me why it's not going to carry on down that curve. And it's the same with precision biology and so on in, in terms of our ability to produce food. So we're not very good at, 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 at kind of um, understanding complexity or extrapolating kind of exponential change. And, um, and, 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 and really that's kind of the, you know, the heart of what we do. So, so we, you know, we, we, we don't understand the speed of change, we don't understand the scale of change, and we don't understand the impact of change. And that, you know, that leaves us pretty ill prepared when there is fundamental change. You know, one more thing I'd just say briefly is that, you know, for most of the time, that doesn't really matter. Because change tends to be, you know, we got this pattern that we talked about earlier, long periods of you know, incremental change, you know, when the system is in equilibrium, as the transport system or the energy system have been for 100 years, I mean, there are we might have seen huge technological progress, but it's the same system, the same business model, the same infrastructure, and so on and so forth. I mean, Henry Ford would recognize our, you know, our, our, our road transportation system today. Um, so, so, you know, it's not a bad, that sort of linear extrapolation, it's not a bad approximation for the future. But when you come up to these periods of rapid transformation or disruption, you know, it's, it's woefully inadequate. And, and um, that's where we are. So, right. I think you've told me before that the, you know, we're very much just living off the systems that were set in place for the industrial revolution. And all of a sudden we're at the brink of something that is very different from that. Um, and so I've heard you say something a couple of times in different interviews where you say, information is now disrupting matter and energy that's intriguing what exactly do you mean when you're saying that right yeah so i mean the system we have today the the, the production system the paradigm of production is what we call an extraction based system of production right so what we're doing is harnessing scarce inputs you know resource it land labor capital but really resources and people right the inputs into the economy and 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 um <clears throat> you know materials flow globally so we, we've done it at whatever scale a civilization can operate at you know today it's global so we're harnessing resources from around the world scarce resources from around the world um and 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 and, and so in, in 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 many ways kind of um well i'll come back to that in a second so that's a separate thought. so so um, it, it's a global system where well, matter, energy, and information, the foundations of the physical world, flow globally. Um, what we're seeing now is, is a move, certainly in energy and, and matter, to a much more distributed production system. 
So, I mean, you, you know, look at the global energy system today, for instance, where we, we, we're, we're, you know, getting coal and oil and, and we're shipping it around the world and, 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 and um, firing it, at, you know, burning it essentially in these very centralized, um, this very centralized system. We're going to a much more distributed system where there's, there's a, you know, there's a huge effort to build that system. But once you build it, there's no flow of material through that system at all. Right. And, 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 and it becomes a much more localized system. Same with food. We're going to be able to produce food pretty much anywhere. The, you just need a carbohydrate source, essentially, to fire you know, precision fermentation, the processes that will produce our food. And it's a sort of model of, you know, almost as food as software. So we, we can and, and, and then we'll have, a you know, as we do today, a global information network. So we'll exchange information about, um, you know, molecular, molecular structures or, 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 or proteins. Um, and, 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 and share those globally, but produce them locally. Um, so, so that's what we mean when we say information is disrupting matter. So we'll have virtual global flows of information and the physical flows will be confined to um, you know, much, more, um, much more localized. Now, does that make any sense at all? It does, it does. It's a really <laughs> fascinating way to think about it. Um, first of all, you know, we hear so much about how information is disrupting everything, but to hear it applied to matter and energy, um, and then talking about sort of the flip from local to global, which which is local and which is global, is a, is a really interesting um, uh, point of view that I haven't heard a lot about. Right. Um, the other thing that you are talking about in the report is um, saying that we really need to accelerate adoption of existing technologies that you know, we have a lot of answers now that we can direct towards climate um, change, but we have to accelerate the, um, the adoption of them. And that's its own challenge as we see in the pandemic. <laughs> so we've spoken about um, the importance of social sciences and neuroscience and helping navigate these kinds of massive changes. How big a challenge is mindset and how do we tackle that? Because I mean, that's a, you know, that's a, you just flip with information disrupting matter and energy. That's a flip of the way I've understood the world from my life. Mm -hmm. So from, from the perspective of you guys, obviously mindset is a key part of this. Um, and can the social sciences and, and neuroscience help us understand, you know, more than we've been able to understand about masks and <laughs> vaccines? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that, Terry, but I, I'm going to hazard a, a, a kind of informed guess in some ways. I, I, I think um, I, I think you know what's important to to realize is these are disruptions that are driven by economics, right? So we've got new technologies coming along in each of those core sectors, foundational sectors that are cheaper and better than the ones they're displacing. They also happen to be clean, right? They have almost no environmental impact, you know, vastly more efficient um, processes. And so, you know, we will have market forces at our back, right? Which allows us a totally different perspective. So, you know, th this is happening because of economics essentially. And I think there's a perception amongst policymakers and actually the, the kind of broader public that, that you know, the market forces are a headwind, that there's a cost to transforming and decarbonizing the economy. And we think that's fundamentally wrong. And I think, you know, if you're in a world where market forces are a headwind, then it's hugely difficult and hugely expensive. You need policy, you need global agreement, you need all kinds of things to come together. And you probably need behavior change and you need you know, all kinds of techno fixes to make the existing stuff we have, you know, less, less bad. Um, once you realize that the that, that market forces are, are behind us, and as we go through the 2020s and 2030s, vastly, you know, even more behind us, that the, then, then in many ways, the, the role of policy and the role of, you know, regulated and, 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 and fiscal policy and so on is to um, ease the transition, is to, is to, is to remove incumbency in, in, in every form. Yeah. yeah, not just in terms of subsidy and tax breaks and so on, but also actually mindset. Right, incumbent mindsets, and and um, and and allow 
these technologies to grow. So, so you know, deal with you know the dodgy science that we undoubtedly see every time there's new innovation that comes along, and 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 um, <coughs> and, and and make sure at every level, both in terms of the the regulatory regimes, the, the, the you know the the tax regimes, but also the public debate, that there is. Um, <coughs> Well, the resistance to change is diminished because it's, um, and, and and that comes also by you know providing the social policies that can allow actually us to understand the benefits of this. You know, for us, that there is a, you know, there's a vastly more resilient, more prosperous, more stable, um, um, more environmentally friendly world that emerges out of the end of these disruptions. But it's going to be incredibly unstable as we go through it. So, you know, in many ways. Um, in many ways, that's the challenge, and 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 you know, mindset here is 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 everything. You know how we how we how we see the world and how we understand what's possible is 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 ultimately critical because you know either we we go to one box of of tools and and do you know what we're doing now a kind of bit of everything what what Tony would call a whack a mole approach to dealing with climate change, or we go to another which is much more about just smoothing the way. And it's a totally different tool set and a totally different set of possibilities. And I think I think that's what we're worried about because some of the very well-meaning interventions that we're making in order to solve climate change actually make it worse. You know, it's kind of like medieval doctors conducting bloodletting. Um, you know, you know, it's it, 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 it's not the right answer, and 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 often they can be actively counterproductive. Some of the some some of the interventions that are suggested. So you, yeah, because you do spend some time talking about this elect, eclectic array of band aid approaches that are that is not helpful and we don't have time for. Um, what would be an example of that? Well, they fall into a number of categories. So, um, I mean, techno fixes, right? I've just been, I've just been looking at, at, at livestock farming. So, so you know, when we don't see what's possible in terms of novel protein production to disrupt livestock farming, then we're left up. Then we're left essentially trying to patch up livestock farming. So just in the last two weeks, I've seen three kind of almost funny examples of making livestock farming, uh, well, emit less greenhouse gases. You know, one of which is, you know, change their diet so that they fart and burp less, right? Apparently if you add algae to food, you get a 20% 20, 20 reduction in methane. Another one was potty training cows, right? Apparently if you teach them to, um, you know, urinate in a particular area of a field when they're babies they'll do that and that makes it easier to collect and you get <laughs> you get a reduction in emissions and another one was I, I couldn't quite work it but it was some kind of plasma lighting um technology that was basically zapping you know cow manure i mean ludicrous but you know you get a slight improvement and so we're desperately kind of patching up that system you know, rather than saying, actually, this is a whole, you know, we don't need the animal anymore. We don't need livestock farming. There's another way that's both cheaper, healthier, better for the environment, more resilient, more secure, better for our health, you know, better in every parameter. And yet we just ignore it and we're not doing anything, you know, so we're concentrating, we're sort of inside the box of the old system, concentrating on kind of patching it up and doing what we can to make it a bit better. But it's not a solution, right? It's, it's, it's entirely temporary. Um, you know, and, and I think, but we get, we, we mistake, we mistake these band-aids for cures. I think that's the problem. So they can't possibly solve climate change. They can make it a bit better. They might buy us a few more years. I'm not demeaning them. They're going to be necessary. We will need some band-aids, but we mustn't mistake them for cures because it will take our focus off what ultimately is the solution to this, which is an entirely new paradigm of production. So, and... Is it the the new paradigm of production, or is it the um, exponential systems, technological systems change that is is what's wrong with conventional forecasting? So when people talk about climate change now, um, you've been fairly critical of just the conventional forecasting, the, the way they're they're thinking about and, and giving us the prognostications about what's going to happen. Yeah, but it's, it's it's a number of things we've touched on some, but really it's about you know how big of a picture are you looking at in some ways and i think mm -hmm. i think part of the problem so, so we don't understand the processes of change we don't understand the speed the scale or the impact of change right so so we don't see what's possible we don't see how quickly we can transform the system but more important work well, it's not more important it's also important is, is that actually this represents a new paradigm of production okay so this is not like a third industrial revolution or a fourth industrial revolution as i've heard it 
um, described. It's a total transformation of our system of production, as big as the Neolithic revolution was when we went from foraging you know, to, to, to farming, essentially. It's going to transform society at a massive scale. And we touched a little bit on this before, but, you know, we have this extractive model that we've had since the dawn of civilization based on harnessing scarce resources. And in such a model, there's what we call a growth imperative, right? So, so um, you know, civilizations are in competition for resources. And so you either, you either grow and compete or you get outgrown and outcompeted. You either exploit or you get exploited. And so, you know, whichever civilizations have best been enabled to, to, to best been able to enable that kind of growth have, have, have expanded and taken over and, and sort of dominated their era. And, um, you know, those that have tried to live more sustainably and more equitably, you know, have, have, have hampered growth and, and progress and, and become dominated, right? And, 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 and so that's really what's driven you know, in many ways, the cycle of history and into such a model, you know, the, the you know, exploitation of people and planet are essentially hardwired. And this is why we've seen this cycle of, of, of kind of boom and breakthrough and then bust and collapse in civilizations. And, and, and it's where we are today. You know, we, we, we've, we've expanded and we've, we've you know, we've, we've exceeded our limits and we're kind of living on borrowed time now. And unless we do something, we, you know, collapse is inevitable. I mean, you know, it has to happen. And just patching up the old system is not enough. So, so understanding that is really important because what's coming now is a totally different system. It's not an extraction-based system. It's what we call a creation-based system. It's based on essentially creating and generating what we need from abundantly available local resources, the photons, electrons, molecules, and cells. We need to produce pretty much anything, you know, everything we, 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 we use and need are available in abundance locally. So we have sort of localized self-sufficiency in this massively distributed system that we talked about before. And that's a fundamentally different paradigm. You know, it essentially it cuts the Gordian knot that we have in our current system where, you know, environmental outcomes and social outcomes and economic outcomes are all in conflict with each other. It's a sort of zero sum game. You can't, you can't solve them all together. You know, solving climate change involves sacrificing social or economic outcomes and, 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 and so on. In this new system, they're not intractable anymore. They're tractable. You can solve them all together. And I think that's a, you know, that, that, that takes some realizing, I think. And that's, um, you know, and, 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 and so that I think is another failure of, 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 of mindset. Or imagination, right? Or so imagination. The, the, I, the, um, so how do you, Jimmy, feel about sci-fi and um, you know, so all the science fiction, the dystopian science fiction that's out there and current narratives around climate change? If, you know, all you have to do is watch Netflix for a couple of hours every night and like, <laughs> know what our future is. Um, and people fleeing Earth for space. Do you feel storytelling itself is a critical component of change and sort of telling ourselves better stories about climate and, and this, this moment in history? Yeah. I, I think storytelling is incredibly important, and I think I think you know you know we have a lot to learn. We we've used it we've used it very poorly today. I think it's much easier to tell a story about yesterday, about a kind of imagined romantic world that we might go back to. So so you know there's a big kind of regenerative agriculture movement that we see that we want to go back to a kind of pre-industrial landscape and regenerate the soils and, 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 and suck carbon from the atmosphere and, and live a much more sustainable life. And that's fine. That's a lovely, lovely, beautiful kind of story and a, and a great ambition. But it's also a kind of Band-Aid solution, right? It, it's trying to make farming less impactful and, 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 and more positive. But it's still within the old system. You know, we need to tell a story about a new system that, 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 that communicates, you know, this huge hope and this huge possibility in this new system. We have the ability to take farming off the land, you know, rather than go back to a, a pre-industrial landscape, we can go back to a pre-Neolithic landscape, right? We can go back to, 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 to an incredible, and then, and then, you know, we solve all the other environmental problems together, not just climate change. We don't just um, use land as a massive carbon sink, but we can also, it reduces the pressure on forests, which you wouldn't get with regenerative agriculture. You know, we, we no longer need to fish the seas, you know, to strip mine the seas. Um, we, you know, we, we all kinds of, you know, soil degradation, all kinds of environmental problems, pollution of all sorts 
get solved by 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 um, disrupting livestock farming essentially. But yeah, it sounds like you know some horrible kind of sci-fi dystopia to people. And I think um, you know, and it could be if we make the wrong choices going forward, we might not. We, we might not end up in this incredible world that I think we can get to. Um, we might end up in, a, in, in an absolute dystopia that's vastly more unequal than our world today. I think we might get the benefit of the, these new technologies, but if we don't reorganize what we term our organizing system, the way we kind of govern and, 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 and structure ourselves, then, then you know, we, we might see, you know, because in an inf we talked about information disrupting matter, you know, in, in, we have to, when you're manipulating matter, you have economies of scale and they're powerful kind of determinants of competitive advantage. In the information world, you have network effects. You know, you get a, a, essentially a single winner and, you know, mm -hmm. it's a winner takes all dynamic. So it could be a vastly more unequal um, world out the other side of this. So somehow we need to tell better stories and make it much more aspirational. We, we certainly need a North Star to keep us moving forward here and not kind of reaching for the certainty and comfort of yesterday. Right. So would you say you're an optimist or a pessimist when it comes to our ability to weather this climate change storm? I'm a, I'm a measured optimist. I think we have the tools that we need to solve climate change. You know, in our analysis, you know, we can do this. We, we, you know, every, we have all the tools we need today to, to not just decarbonize the economy, but ultimately to be able to remove carbon from the atmosphere, both through you know, the land that we free up, but also because, um, you know, we have a, a super abundance of, of clean and almost free energy that we can use um, in, 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 in sequestering carbon. So, you know, we think we can get, you know, well below zero by 2040. So, so that makes me an optimist. So I'm, I'm an optimist from a technological standpoint. I don't think we need any major breakthroughs. Um, but, um, from from an ability for us to adapt our mindsets to see the possibilities and to maintain the kind of social cohesion that we need through the face of you know what needs to be a massive disruption of our societies, massive transformation. I'm not sure. I'm 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 I'm, I'm pretty certain that some regions of the world will do this, but I'm also pretty certain there'll be claps in other regions um, before before we break. So I, I think there's an inevitability to that. I think some, some regions will just be unable to make the adaptations necessary. We're not gonna talk about what those regions are. I mean, I think they're sort of decision-making. Yeah, decision-making. Yeah, decision-making. Yeah. Yeah. Regulatory so, capture, just, yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah. Do you, um, so it's speaking to that reductive nature and, and not being able to sort of put the pieces together when you're really talking about complexity science and, and systems change. Um, have you, has your team considered how to encourage more interdisciplinary conversation around these systems issues? Because it does seem like that is also one of the problems here. Yeah, no, it, it, I mean, it certainly is. I mean, you know, that's another way in which we silo ourselves by, you know, academic disciplines. And there are some moves to, to kind of cross those boundaries and to allow people to kind of collaborate and, and, and problem solve across across disciplines. You know, we, we don't necessarily see that as our role to enable that or facilitate that. I mean, we're not an academic body, but what we do try and do and what we have on our team are people from all kinds of you know backgrounds. We you know it's you know it's it's almost deliberate that we you know we end up with you know, I'm <laughs> by my undergraduate. Um, Education. I'm a historian, and 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 um, you know we have complex systems experts, and we have social scientists, and so on. So it, the, the, there's a real, there's a you know there's a real mix on our team, and I, I I think that needs to be shared, you know, much more broadly because you know these are these are these are problems that won't be solved in any individual field, and I think it's um, you know we're moving from a from an era of ever greater specialization, not just in academically, but in in terms of of, of labor more generally to one of much more generalization. And, and I think that, you know, I find that exciting. Yeah, I, we were recently talking to someone who was talking about the, the, the talent, um, so not T-shaped talents, someone who has a very deep knowledge in, in, in a field and then a horizontal ability to look across fields, but pie-shaped talent, where I might have two vertical right. uh, concentrations where I, that I am very versed in, but then I can also see across, and that does seem to be increasingly important as we move into these, um, you know, wicked problems 
that we're trying yeah. to solve. Uh, yeah, and, and also just an, uh, an understanding of complexity, I think, across everything. I think that's that's really important. That's a counterbalance. You know, in many ways, I guess the industrial era, I always think of it in my in my mind as it's been a kind of paradigm of physics. Right? It's quite, it's quite it, it, you know, it's somewhat reductive. The new, you know, we need to add to that, I think, a sort of paradigm of biology, right? Much more interconnectedness and, and, and much more understanding of the interactions. And I think I think that's that's kind of, well, that, that's how I reduce it in my own mind. That's my simplification. No, that's a really helpful analogy to try to think about what we're really talking about here. And um, so in your opinion, what happens next? Do you expect anything from COP26? <laughs> no, I mean, one word answer, no. Um, yeah. I expect a lot of announcements. I expect um, a, a lot of frantic activity. I expect us to try all kinds of different interventions. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think I, I referred to it earlier, and this is what Tony calls it, the sort of whack-a-mole strategy, where you try everything and, 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 and all kinds of, including stuff, you know, that's really not helpful, things like nuclear and, 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 um, and, and so on, which just economically just can't, you know, can't compete. Um, and, you know, I expect us to, you know, make a bunch of announcements. I, but, you know, I think what we're seeing now is A, ambition being raised, and B, I don't think we're there yet, but I think there's a dawning realization that actually this can happen, right? I mean, you know, the economics now are so clear, that we're, you know, you don't have to follow that solar cost curve or the battery cost curve much further to realize that actually this is this is really transformational, and I think you know that. Um, so 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 I you know I do feel that that, that um, you know COP maybe I'm a bit cynical about. I think it's I think it's a really useful um, event to bring some you know cohesion globally. I still think we're looking, we're failing to understand quite what's possible. And, 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 and so we are very much in that kind of headwind mindset that we talked about earlier yeah. and not in that tailwind yeah. mindset of kind of just easing the path of, 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 of you know, the, 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 the technological disruptions that are gonna, gonna get us there. So if this is true, who drives the type of agenda you're proposing? Who, you know, is it, you know, I don't even know if government's even capable. Is it industry? Is it coalition of scientists? Like, who drives this forward in your mind? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it's the invisible hand, right? It's, it's. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, no, but it, it's, it's, it. You know, and I, I think, you know, I think the top-down mechanism is not necessarily the right one. I think um, okay. it's very useful to have a a global. Kind of perspective and a global ambition and agreement, kind of high level, and I think that's useful. I think in terms of actually pushing this through, you know, it is. I mean, it's kind of bottom up. It's a, it's a, it's distributed. The businessmen, <laughs> the technologists, the you know, the financiers who are funding this, who are going to deliver this kind of system, and it's you know, it's um, you know, it's going to happen. I and and um, and it's you know, it's not just going to solve climate you know a clean energy system doesn't just solve climate change I, th I think that you know you know the the whole kind of equity issue needs to be answered as well right and i think that's a you know that's a I mean, we probably don't have time for that that discussion that but you know these um you know um solar wind and batteries these clean technologies clean energy technologies are, are inherently more equitable than the, the the kind of extractive ones and 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 i think it's you know, they're, they're, they'll be transformational. And I think I think that's a, a kind of really exciting outcome we'll see as we go through the next decade. So you've been incredibly generous with your time and we are actually up at, at it, but I wanted to just give you the opportunity. We talked across a wide range. I know we think X does a lot more than climate change analysis, um, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? Wow. Um, the capper? <laughs> yeah, I mean, what, you know, what I would say is it, it, it's always been technologies that have created possibilities for progress. And, and you, you know, the answer is not to kind of give up consumption to reduce our, to, to reduce our environmental impact. It never can be, it can never be a solution because, you know, I mean, A, you can't reduce consumption to zero. You can't get down, you certainly can't get down below zero. 
And the kind of suffering that you trigger by trying to do that will be just unconscion un unconscionable. And, 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 um, and so I th think it's important to realize that better tools, better technologies are the only way for us to solve this problem. And, 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 and so, you know, rather than focusing on, on behavior change and guilt and, and fear, I think it's really important that we focus on, you know, really what, what is the most incredible opportunity for, for, for society, for business, for investors, for, um, you know, for, 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 for leaders across society to, um, to grab with both hands. I mean, this is, you know, this is an opportunity that we've never had before and, and and i think we can you know we can we can solve a lot of the world's problems and make money and become more prosperous here as we d deliver and develop these better tools these better technologies and i think i think it's really important to realize that and i think the pessimism and the kind of guilt that we feel that makes us want to just punish ourselves and give up is actually a really unhelpful instinct and we'll, you know, if we, if we go down that path, we'll, we'll, you know, we just won't have the capital available. We'll have such economic destruction that we won't be able to afford to roll out the new energy, food and transport system. And we'll be locked in that industrial, extractive, polluting system. We're essentially cut off our only lifeboat by heading down that path. And I think it's a really, really dangerous. And I'd much rather spread a message of hope and optimism and, and, and provide some kind of North Star that might guide us to, to, to solving these problems. And I, and I think that's, a, that's an, a really important role and a really important thing for us to bear in mind. I would agree. The, um, the report is on our site as well on polyplexus.com if you wanna take a look at it and um, get more familiar. And I think the your URL is rethinkx.com, is that correct? That's exactly right, yes. All right, well, thanks a million, Jamie. Really appreciate your time and your work. Um, and uh, thanks for, Telling, telling us a little bit about it. Thanks, Terry, that was fun. I appreciate it.